Good afternoon and welcome to the Art Museum of West Virginia University and the second of our Lunchtime Look series for 2023. We are thrilled to have you here. Just a few notes. After today's presentation, there will be some time for Q&A. We are recording um, so that this session will be on the Art Museum's YouTube stream after it has been closed captioned. And to that end, if you have a question, I will pass the microphone to you so that your voice can be captured onto that stream as well. Um, but we are not live streaming today. So you all are our intimate audience. We thank you very much for coming out on such a cold and blustery day. But I think you, we have a real treat in store for you. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michaela Myers, who is Associate Dean of Artistic and Scholarly Achievement at the West Virginia University College of Creative Arts, where she is also a professor of violin and a nationally recognized violinist. Today she will weave her personal and professional musical trajectory into that of many of the musicians featured in this exhibition, In Concert, Photography and the Violin, from the collection of Evan Mirapal. And we are thrilled to welcome her here today to make those connections for us. Please help me uh, join me in welcoming Michaela. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather, for all of your work in putting this presentation together, and to Jason Zay and Sierra for their technical uh, expertise over here. So I feel like a kid in a candy shop. I mean, here we are just surrounded by all the great violinists and beautiful uh, photographs of unknown violinists, of people who are holding violins in their photos just because it's a cool thing to do, as we all know. And um, so we're just gonna dive right in. And what we have for you today is, we'll be talking about a number of photographs uh, that either I'll show here or are hanging in the exhibition. We've made reproductions of them and we'll be passing them around so you can see them uh, up close. They're, you can put your fingers all over them, okay? They, they are not the originals that we're passing around so you can feel comfortable doing that. So the first thing I wanna do is dive into a photograph that is right over here of the violinist Carl Flesch. So we'll start passing this around. Thank you, Heather. So Carl Flesch um, is, is a very famous violinist. This, this photograph was taken in 1910. Even though he was born in Hungary, he was really known as a German violinist because most of his career took place in Germany. And while he was really very, very famous as a performer and as a teacher during his time, I know that some of the violin students here today will recognize and fear this book right here, which is the Carl Flesch Scale System. And so we violinists refer to this as a pound of flesh. So this is a really uh, important part of our technical uh, uh, warm-ups and a, a part of something that we, we study from a young age. Uh, but it's really very fascinating for me to actually see that picture of Carl Flesch because what we find in a lot of these photographs are a lot of clues to the kind of techniques that violinists were using. Um, things about their instruments. You might notice as you start looking uh, through these photographs of a lot of these famous concert violinists don't have a shoulder rest, for example, on the back of their violins. Very interesting for us to see that. In the Carl Flesch photograph, we can see an example of what we refer to as a German bow hold. And this is a bow hold that is not commonly used anymore. Um, but it was used during Carl Flesch's time, so in the 1800s into the early 1900s. And it was, a, it was a bow hold that primarily focused on using your fingertips to touch the stick because the fingertips are the most sensitive. So therefore, that would give you the most sensitivity in your playing, right? But the problem with it was is that it locked up everything else in your hand. It forced your thumb to be kind of locked up and it wasn't really great for the big kind of projection that we need in the Clay Theater and Heinz Hall, the kind of spaces that we're playing in. So it's interesting to see that Carl Flesch, this great pedagogue, is actually using this, this German bow hold that we wouldn't use so much today. There is another photograph um, around the corner that I hope you'll get a chance to look at 
up close, uh, but we have a reproduction of it here, of Joseph Joachim. Joseph Joachim was um, a violinist who was kind of the muse of the famous composer Johannes Brahms. Brahms was always writing his violin works for Joachim. Um, and when I saw that photograph, I, I gasped out loud because his hands are huge. And suddenly I was like, well, that's why the opening of the Brahms concerto is written for somebody with huge hands. That's why there's these huge leaps in, in the works by Brahms. So there's a lot of sort of interesting details that come to the foreground in these photographs. But I want to take us back to that Carl Flesch photograph and look behind him. And what we see behind Carl Flesch is something that you often see in every violinist studio, and that is a number of pictures or photographs or artistic works that are very, very meaningful to that violinist. And you'll see those there in that Carl Flesch photograph. And so in my violin studio here at WVU, there are a number of photographs of famous violinists, some of these same violinists that are here in this exhibition, that are signed, best wishes, to a violinist named Harold Wolf. And Harold Wolf was a really fantastic American violinist, and he was my grandfather. And so this is why I have these photographs. And so I'm bringing some of these photographs to you here today to share with you and connect up with, with the photographs that are here in the exhibition. So uh, my grandfather, um, Harold Wolf, was born uh, in the United States to Polish Jewish immigrants in California. Uh, he showed uh, talent on the violin from a very young age, and when he was maybe about nine, ten years old, a famous violinist named Ephraim Zimbalist was in uh, Los Angeles and heard my grandfather play and said to his parents, he's got great talent, he needs to come study with me at Curtis, at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia. So his parents said, okay, we got it, we got to move to Philadelphia, he has great talent, he's got to go to Curtis. And so he did that and he started having his lessons at the Curtis Institute and it soon became clear that it was maybe going to be an even a better situation for him to be studying at Juilliard and so his parents uprooted again and moved to New York City. But first he had to play his audition for Juilliard. So here's the thing about my grandfather. Even when he was grown up, he was, he was only about 5'2", but he had a huge personality and he had, a, shall we say, a lot of confidence. Um, like a lot of violinists, he might have had kind of a big ego. We just have to have it, right, to be able to play this, this little thing and think that people want to listen to that. So he is a big personality, very funny, a lot of fun. And so he told the story of his audition at Juilliard when he was 14 years old. He walked into this room where some of the, the day's most, most highly regarded violinists were sitting there. And they said to him, Mr. Wolf, what concerto would you like to play for us today? And he said, what concerto do you want me to play for you today? <laughs> and he truly was prepared. I mean, he was really a child prodigy. He was ready to play Tchaikovsky concerto and Sibelius concerto and Mendelssohn and all of those things. And so it was a, was a successful audition. He received uh, the New York Philharmonic uh, a scholarship to attend Juilliard. And so he started his studies there. And so he was really on a trajectory to have probably a career as a, as a soloist, certainly as, as a concert master. And as he was finishing up in Juilliard, he won his first concert master position. Um, and this uh, was with the uh, Columbia Symphony in Columbia, uh, uh, North Carolina. But right around this time, um, he was also playing on a radio show. And there was a young woman named Catherine who lived in a small town in Ohio, Lisbon, Ohio. She wasn't a musician, but she loved opera. She loved classical music. And she would tune into this radio show and hear this, this young violinist playing. And they started writing letters to each other. So his career is taking off, but so is World War II. It's happening. And my grandfather is drafted uh, by the US Army to actually uh, perform in an entertainment unit for the Army. Um, but also he had, had to be serving uh, in fighting as well. So he had a little bit of time he, while he was on leave, while he was in basic training. 
in um, Tennessee, and apparently he and Catherine met up in Pittsburgh. My mom was made in Pittsburgh. Um, so yes, that's, that's what happened. They got married, he, she was pregnant. Um, here is a kind of a love letter photograph that he sent to Catherine. You might be able to see this, this signature up here. Again, this reproduction is fine. Go ahead and, and touch it. It's a really wild photograph. It shows my grandfather with his, sort of his bow arms way up here, and he's out in the woods in Tennessee rehearsing with the army band uh, before they deploy. And he sent this um, picture to Catherine. It's one little photograph that I forgot to share here. Of course, as before he's drafted and, and as he's starting his, his career um, as a concertmaster, um, here is one of his professional pictures. You'll notice that it is uh, very similar to the, the photographs are in here with the sort of the violin held up high and the, the serious look on the face. Okay, so at this time, what violin is he playing? He, there was a violin uh, made for, for him um, by Nathaniel Rosenthal in New York City. It was made from a violin, made from my grandfather, just as he's starting his career before he goes off to war. Um, it's a really nice violin. It's a little bit smaller than your, your sort of average violin because, again, he was a little bit smaller in stature. So when my grandfather was drafted and had to go fight in World War II with the, with the band, this is the violin that he landed on a beach at Normandy just a couple days after D-Day with. And he literally had it in his case over his head to get, to get up onto the beach that day. So for this violin to make it through a war, he told a little lie and he said that it was a Stradivarius, which it's not. And so they built a special box for it and it had kind of springs in it and they actually stored it in the artillery truck with the weapons. And this is how it made it through the war. So I have a photo here of him with the Yankee Jubilee Band. So he's, uh, Harold Wolf, my grandfather, is standing in front of the band. And you can see the band members there. And this is the entertainment unit that he was uh, performing with throughout the war. He um, told a lot of wonderful stories about the kinds of uh, performances that they did throughout that time. He played for generals. Uh, he had an opportunity to meet the Pope. Um, he didn't, I think, uh, like a lot of, of people from World War II, he really didn't talk about the fighting. We know that he was stuck for a while at the Battle of the Bulge, um, that that was something that, that, that happened. Um, so we just kind of hear these stories. We know that this was the violin that was played. And we know that even today there are the the military bands are a really crucial part of our military system of, of keeping people happy and uplifted. And at this time, there was a great comedian uh, named Jack Benny. And he was, right, so Jack Benny is a wonderful comedian, but he also happened to be a fantastic violinist. He played that down. He acted like he was not a fantastic violinist. He was a very good violinist. And so many of his comedy routines uh, involved uh, playing the violin. So the next photograph that's in the collection that um, we'll, we'll pass around a copy of here is located right here. And in this photo, we see Jack Benny in um, the Nuremberg Stadium. And this was taken, taken in, on July 4th, 1945. He's on a USO tour. He's lifted up on the shoulders of, of these soldiers. And if you look through the picture, you just see these big smiles on everyone's faces and he's playing his violin. And so this is a really important moment uh, for, for the soldiers, for the war coming to an end, and this celebration of this comedian who uh, uses a violin as a medium for, for his comedy and joy. So um, I thought that we would take a, just a quick look at a little, little shtick by Jack Benny so we can get a sense of, of why he's really the musician's comedian. All right, hit it, Sierra. Great. OK, so while my grandfather is off at war, my mother is born. He comes back from war, and um, it's time to restart this career that had just been taken off. 
was just taking off. He actually first lands a position with the LA Philharmonic. He's playing in the section there. Um, but the, the conductor at the time, this is how these things used to work, Bruno Walter, the conductor at the time, said to his buddy, um, who's the conductor of the Utah Symphony, Maurice Abravanel, hey, you know, there's this kid in my orchestra, I think he'd make a great concert master for the Utah Symphony, why don't you check him out? So my grandfather goes and plays for Abravanel, and he becomes the concert master of the Utah Symphony. And this is a post that he holds um, from 1952 until 1966. Now, as concert master of an orchestra, especially at that time, he had a lot of contact with the guest conductors and the guest solo, soloist musicians who would come through um, to work with the orchestra. In fact, it was often his job to go pick up violinists from the train as they came into town. Um, and so at this time is when he starts getting these photographs, these really wonderful photographs with some of the, the guests that come through. So this is one of the photographs that hangs in my studio. This is Aaron Copeland and my grandfather. And um, Copeland would often conduct his own music with, with orchestras. And so you can see my grandfather sort of consulting Copeland about something in the first violin part, having a discussion about it. Now, I've had this, this photograph for a long time. I didn't realize it was signed by Copeland until I was rehanging it up. And I realized that there's no ink, but the pressure of the pen is there. And so when I tilt, the, this, this original, I can see that it says to Harold Wolf, Wolf with best wishes from Aaron Copeland. So this is one of the um, things in my studio. This next one, of course, is very special. So this is Jack Benny and my grandfather rehearsing. So here we have Jack Benny. Here is my grandfather. I'll send around the copy of it. So I of course, my mom luckily knows all these stories and is able to, to talk very specifically about what, what is happening. And so she was telling me what was actually happening in this picture. This is a rehearsal. And Jack Benny was a great supporter of symphony orchestras. And so he had a certain kind of shtick and show that he would do and he would travel around and do with orchestras. And the particular shtick was that he would be playing solo with the orchestra and he would be having trouble with a passage and the concert master would stand up and kind of show him how it's done and that Jack Benny would storm off the stage and that was that was the the shtick and then the concert would end with Jack Benny and the concert master playing the Bach double together so I love this picture I look at it every day because my grandfather's just cracking up he's having so much fun and I think these are the moments in his musical life that were just very very special for him so, as he's concertmaster of Utah Symphony, he realizes he needs to get a, a better violin. So the Rosenthal is good, but everybody's playing strads these days, and maybe it's time for him to do that as well. So, my mom said that one day she came home, and he had two Stradivarius violins and a Burgundy. Now, Stradivarius um, was a, uh, probably, he's considered really the greatest violin maker of all time. Uh, and he was making violins in what we call the golden era of violin making in Cremona, Italy. And it was in the, through the 1700s is that time. So Carlo Bergunzi Jr. Um, is making violins in Cremona at the very end of, of that golden era. And so he had these two strads and he had this Bergunzi and he was trying to figure out which one he liked the best. And so he told my mom, will you go outside and go down to the end of the driveway and I'm gonna play each one and you tell me which one projects the furthest. And it was the Burgundy was the one that was always projecting the furthest. So in the end, he decided uh, to get the Burgundy. So he started playing this violin. So this violin, to put it in perspective, uh, was made in 1797. This is around the time that Beethoven is working on his first symphony. This is when this violin was made. Okay. So, now, it's time to talk, we talked about the great violins, it's time to about, talk about the greatest violinist of that time, and his name is Yasha Heifetz, and there are a number of uh, Heifetz photographs in here. So, Heifetz was a Russian violinist who immigrated to the United States pretty early in his career. He um, was a violinist who played at a level that had really never been heard. There were other 
great violinists, of course, Fritz Kreisler, uh, Nathan Milstein, uh, Misha Elman, people who were just playing beautifully, but nobody had played with this kind of perfection, this kind of electric vibrato, um, the speed, and with a real attitude, too. Famous for, Heifetz was famous for just not moving at all. Everything just happened here. He held the violin up high. He was known as not a very nice guy. Um, it didn't really matter because he, he was really the greatest violinist. So there is a famous story about Heifetz from his Carnegie Hall debut, which he made in 1917. And the story goes that another famous violinist of the time, Misha Elman, was sitting there next to his friend, who was a pianist, Leopold Godowski. And Elman leaned over to Godowski and he said, is it hot in here? And Godowski said, not for pianists. Okay. So I want to direct our attention to some really amazing photographs that are here. And we can look straight down the hallway here. And I will pass these to you as well. On the left is the Heifetz photograph. And on the right is Yehudi Menuhin. So Heifetz and Yehudi Menuhin. We'll talk a little bit more about Menuhin in a, in a little bit. Um, so now, right behind Dr. Schwartz, I'm going to have everybody turn around there. Yes, yeah, so right behind her are three fantastic photographs by Irving Penn. So Dr. Schwartz will point to the first one is Fritz Kreisler. Yep. To the left, there. In the middle, Yasha Heifetz. And to the right, Yehudi Menuhin. And this is this very distinctive uh, photograph of Irving Penn. He, he had this setup of putting people in the corner. You kind of think, like, nobody puts Yasha Heifetz in the corner where Irving Penn does. So those are really interesting uh, photographs to take a look at. So Heifetz, oh, and let me pass those around. You guys can take a look at those. OK, so here are our reproductions of our Irving Penn. We have Fritz Kreisler, the great Aus Austrian violinist, Yasha Heifetz, and Yehudi Menuhin is an American violinist. So Heifetz is looming large, and he comes to play solo with the Utah Symphony. And my grandfather gets a chance to not only talk to him, but he says, hey, do, do you want to try the Burgundy? And Heifetz said, sure, and he handed over his Guarneri del Jesu, and they tried each other's violins. And Heifetz really liked the Burgundy, is what my grandfather told me. So after this interaction, of course, my grandfather was able to get a signed photograph by Yasha Heifetz to Harold Wolf with best wishes, Yasha Heifetz. Um, my violin students know in the past, when they've had a really good lesson, that they get to have their picture taken with Heifetz. <laughs> and that's a big deal. We post it to Instagram for everybody to see. All right, so remember that it was Misha Elman who, who said, is it hot in here at Heifetz's debut? Well, Misha Elman came to play with the Utah Symphony. And as was kind of tradition, the concertmaster and his wife would, would take the soloist out afterwards. Um, but on this, this night, uh, they needed to make a quick stop at my grandfather's house. Misha Elman hated Yasha Heifetz. I'm sure the fact that this story was circulating about it's hot in here did not help the fact um, that also his career was a little bit sidelined by there's this, this big shining star from the same studio in Russia, from Leopold Auer's studio, and here is the big shot. So my grandparents had that signed Yasha Heifetz picture prominently displayed in their living room. And my grandmother realized this. And so as they were pulling up to the house, she said, oh, Mr. Elman, you know, our, our dog sometimes has a little bit of accident. Will you just stay here for a moment? I'm going to run inside and just make sure everything's OK, and then you can come in. And she ran inside, and she took the Heifetz photo, and she stuck it in a drawer, and she put it away. So Elman comes in. He's looking around. Of course, there's all these other kinds of photographs. Looking, and he says, I notice you don't have a picture of me. And so, uh, now fortunately, we can't find this one. We do know that we did have a Misha Elman signed photograph, so he made sure that she had that. So as my grandfather was finishing his career with the Utah Symphony, um, he then moved on to, he was concertmaster of Alabama Symphony and then San Diego Symphony, and then finally 
in the early 1970s, settled into really what was the, uh, a big part of his career and, and the final part of his career, which was playing the Hollywood movie soundtracks in LA. So his very first movie that he recorded was The Godfather. And he also did the Die Hard movies. He did Pretty Woman, Indiana Jones, Back to the Future. And what's very interesting about how residuals work, so the, the payment from these movies, is that when my grandfather passed away, he passed away just a little over 10 years ago, and the, the residual, residuals went on to my grandmother, and when she passed away, they have gone on to my mom. So every July, my mom gets this printout of all the movies and, and TV shows and soundtracks that my grandfather played on, where they streamed, how much each one made, and she gets a check. And she calls me up and she'll say, Julia Roberts is taking us to Nordstrom's this year. <laughs> Bruce, Willis, Bruce Willis is taking us on a trip. So it's very interesting that to this day that that is a, a real living legacy of, of his time there. So um, I was born in 1975 in Portland, Oregon. And um, so my, grand, my grandparents were in LA. I was in Portland, so that was easy to go and visit them. And we would often do that. And so on my very first birthday, my grandfather played happy birthday for me on his Burgundy. Yeah. So this is me. And I, I'm fascinated by the fact that I'm more interested in that violin than that cake. It's a little different situation now, but I probably hadn't had cake yet. OK. So very, very interested in what's happening there. My grandfather had above his dining room table um, his very first violin, really tiny, like 16th size violin, which is hung there as a decoration. And when I was four years old, my family came down to Los Angeles for Thanksgiving. And we sat down at the, at the dining room table and I looked up and the violin wasn't there. And so I asked him, Grandpa, where's the violin? He said, ah, come with me. So he had had the violin, all new strings put on it, all shined up, all ready to go. We went into his studio, which had lots of photographs in it, of course. And he showed me how to play open strings on the violin. So then I came back out to everybody at the table, and I played my open strings, and they all clapped. And I was like, I'm doing this. <laughs> I love this. So that's where that started. And um, luckily, one of my grandfather's teacher, or students, excuse me, was living in Portland, Oregon. She was a member of the Portland Opera Orchestra, and she became my very first teacher, which was a really nice connection. So I studied with my teacher there in Portland, but um, I would go down to LA often, and in fact, I would go down for periods of three weeks at a time to have lessons with my grandfather. And it was during this time that the indoctrination of the greatness of Yasha Heifetz began. So um, one of my sort of moments that I always really look forward to was I would have a special cookie, and maybe a juice, and I'd get to sit in my grandfather's favorite leather chair, and we'd watch the Heifetz movie. So we're just going to start just a little, just like the first two minutes of the Heifetz movie that I've been watching my entire life. What sort of man is he? Okay, and we can take it there. What sort of man is he? So then we see him playing ping pong, and we see him doing all these sort of things, but then it's time to practice, and the movie goes, goes on. So I'm gonna, we're going to watch another clip of a movie that came out more recently, about 2012, just to kind of get the sense of how important Heifetz was to the violinists and the musicians of this time and even to this day. This is called God's Fiddler. You can guess who God's Fiddler is. He's a stupid rock. Okay, great. Okay, so we get it, right? And this is what I got as well, to the point where um, my, my grandfather would often describe people and their skills in comparison with Heifetz. So, if he took the car to the, the car shop and the mechanic was great, he would say, oh, this guy's a real Heifetz. <laughs> Plumber comes over, he fixes the sink. Oh, he's a real Heifetz. <laughs> Goes somewhere, has a meal, it's okay. You say, "Huh, oh, the chef was good, but he's no Heifetz. All right, so this was, this was how we talked. So my parents sent this to me recently. Here is an article that I wrote um, in first grade about Heifetz. 
and this is my first piece of art to be shown in an art museum. We have, we have Heifetz, there's me playing the violin, and there's the conductor with conductor hair, I note. Okay, so I will read this to you. Heifetz is the greatest violinist in the world. He is very old, but he is still alive. <laughs> he does not play the violin anymore. He does not know how he can play so good. If you want to take lessons from him, he is not a good teacher. <laughs> I find it interesting that I received a C. It says, interesting article, Michaela. I imagine the, the teacher sitting there going, it's good, but she's no hyphens. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this, this Heifetz thing is, is big time for me. And when I was a senior in high school in Portland, Oregon, I was editor of the um, newspaper, the high school newspaper. And the editor got to choose what artwork hung on the, on the uh, wall in the newspaper room. And so I chose, of course, a poster of Heifetz. But at this point, you know, I knew I was a talented violinist, and I was going to go on a career in violin. But I knew I was no high fits, and so the only way that I could really get super close to high fits was to photocopy my hand and overlay it onto high fits. So this is the poster that all my friends had to look at for the whole year, and that's my hand right there. All right, so some of you know that I was a pretty competitive uh, soccer player um, throughout high school and college. And um, those teammates who wished to go with me before a game had to listen to Heifetz to get pumped up on the way to the soccer game. So I want to play just a little bit of really my favorite recording that Heifetz made. Have to understand at this time, you know, there's not all this kind of splicing and recordings that we can do now. When he played, it, it, that's what was recorded, and it was one or two takes, that was it. And so this sort of level of perfection is really, really incredible. Okay, so we're going to listen to just the beginning of the third movement of the Sibelius Violin Concerto by Heifetz playing. Does that make you want to run through a wall? <laughs> that will get you ready to go. Okay, so. We've been talking, of course, a lot about the Russian school of violin playing. You know, Yasha Heifetz was from uh, this, the, the teacher Leopold Auer. Of course, we refer to schools like geographically and sort of musical ideas that flow through them in this, in this violin world. Um, another very, very important school, uh, violin school, was the Franco-Belgian school. And this is really epitomized by the great violinist Eugene Izai. And um, was brought to the United States through two great teachers, uh, Joseph Gingold and then the American violinist Louis Persinger. And as I was uh, looking at where to study uh, for college, I was really very taken by this Franco-Belgian school of, of playing. Really a lot of emphasis on tone, use of vibrato, um, maybe not so much a technical uh, fireworks in your face, but maybe more of an emphasis on, on the musicality, not that they're separate or that one is less important than the other. So um, I was very, very drawn to um, studying with a teacher at Oberlin named Almeida Vemos, who had studied with Louis Persinger. And then for graduate school, um, I was interested and ended up studying with a really fine uh, violinist of, at that time named Fridel Lack, who was also from this Franco-Belgian violin school. Now, Fridel Lack um, ha was in her career really at the same time as my grandfather was, same sort of ages, and my m mom has a really fond memory of Fridel Lack when Ms. Lack came to play with the Utah Symphony, and Ms. Lack always wore a beautiful velvet gown to perform it. And my mom remembers after the concert that Fridel Lack was in the back seat of the car. They were going to go to whatever party was happening. And that my mom, when she was about nine years old, she crawled into the back seat and she said, there was Ms. Lack with this beautiful red velvet gown that was just kind of flowing over to the seat. And she just gave my mom a big hug and snuggled her in. And my mom said she just smelled so good and she just looked so beautiful. She had this really wonderful memory of her. And so it was really kind of exciting that it ended up that this was the teacher that I wanted to study with for uh, my master's and my doctorate. And then when I was first coming through the exhibit a couple weeks ago and looking at all the pictures, lo and behold, right down there is a picture where Todd is of my teacher Fridel Lack. 
And so this is, of course, what she looked like when my mom was getting to snuggle into her velvet dress in the back of the car. She was beautiful. She looked like Snow White. I was sitting with her when she was in her 80s. Um, she was just, just an, an incredible teacher. So, um, of course, my grandfather knew uh, Ms. Lack. They knew each other and had been uh, friends over the years. And so for my master's recital, I invited my grandfather to come perform with me, and we played the Bach double together on my master's recital. And so this is a picture that lives uh, in my violin case, and here's, here's a, a, a picture of it. So this is me after my master's recital. This is Ms. Lack, and this is my grandfather. And so that was just a really wonderful coming together of those moments. Okay, so finally, I'm going to show you my prize, prize photograph. Those are all prize, but it's my prize, prize photograph. All right, so going back to high school, uh, my grandfather had uh, about an eighth grade taught me a piece that we, we don't have, we have favorite pieces, we don't have a favorite piece, but for me this was the first piece that really connected me to, to everything the violin could do. There was rich sonorities to it, it went high, there was double stops, there was fast notes, there was the use of rubato, which is a way that we play with time, and you may feel that things are getting more exciting or kind of calming down, and it's, it's our magic as musicians that we can play with your perception of time through rubato. And this piece was by um, a composer who ended up settling in Oregon, um, and his name's Ernest Bloch. So this was a very important composer to us, uh, those of us who grew up in, in Oregon. We would, we would take tri field trips out to his house on the coast and look where, look where Bloch used to live. And the piece that I was taught is called Nigun, and it is uh, the second in a set of three movements um, that are three pieces from Hasidic life. So exploring, um, each, each piece is exploring a little, a little piece of Hasidic life. And um, this Nigun means improvisation. So I learned this piece, I, I really loved playing it. And in my high school English class, um, we were reading the book, uh, The Chosen by Chaim Potok, uh, about a, a young man's uh, experience, a Jewish young man's experience in, in Brooklyn. And we had to do a final um, project. So I asked my teacher, you know, I, I learned this piece, I love to play it, could I play the Nigun and just kind of connect uh, the book and the piece as a final project? She said, sure. She said, actually, I'd like to invite a friend to that performance, if you don't mind. So her friend came, and it turned out that the friend was the granddaughter of Ernest Bloch, the composer of the piece. So I performed the piece, and after I was done, she presented me with this photograph. This is a photograph of Yehudi Menuhin. Remember, he's down there on the right. Great American violinist connected through the Franco-Belgian uh, tradition, taken by Ernest Bloch, who was also uh, a really wonderful photographer in his time. And so this was a really special um, thing to receive uh, for a performance that I was really happy to do. So f to just uh, finish today, I think we better hear some violin playing. Otherwise, you know, what's the point sitting around with all these violins? I thought, I'm just going to play just the first page of the Nigun for you. So I'll play the piece that I played um, for Ernest Bloch's uh, granddaughter. Um, it's supposed to be with piano, but we don't have a piano here. Um, but I'll just uh, play this for you so you can hear it. And I wanted to turn off this mic here. Yeah. We, we could do the Jack Benny shtick. I could play it first on this one. <laughs> and then I'll play it on this one. When I get the, get the choice, I play on the Benzie because it's a privilege every time. <laughs>
thank you so much for going on this adventure down memory lane with me today. And I'd love to take questions. Yes, so now if anyone has a question for Dr. Myers, I'm happy to bring you the microphone. Yes, Director Tabutis. <laughs> Thank you, Michaela. That was fantastic. Really enjoyed that. You brought the, the personal aspects uh, of violins to the, to the talk. You clearly have a lot of photographs of violins. So has seeing this exhibition or thinking about the role of photography and music changed any? I, I wonder if you could speak a little to that sort of the pictureness. Uh, yeah, of it. Absolutely. So, you know, the biggest thing that has stood out to me was what if Heifetz was around in the Instagram TikTok era? <laughs> because what, what we see in these photographs of Heifetz specifically throughout the exhibit, and the, the, the one I have and in books, is that he, he really knew what he was doing in terms of publicizing the look of the violin. And there's a, there's a photograph kind of behind Todd on the gray wall that is probably the most kind of emulated violin photograph. Um, and he's like this, right? And so this whole thing where we're always told like no droopy doors violins, you know, not like that. it really comes from this Heifetz stance, that's his thing. And so I think about, uh, you know, sort of these, these pictures that are just kind of taken, but really they're posed. I mean, there's Irving Penn taking these, there's Heifetz wanting to pose for Irving Penn. So there's sort of the, um, that element of the importance of photography in publicity for these violinists in a way that I hadn't really thought about. Anyone else? Yes. Hi. I have a question. What was it like taking lessons with your grandfather, like the relationship teacher, grandpa? OK, thank you, Anna. That's a great question. So my mom tried to play the violin, and it ended terribly, because taking lessons with her dad um, was just impossible. And he was, he was sort of a very demanding and pretty, pretty tough teacher. There's a lot of stories from his students over the years of, you know, there's rules that even applied to me. You had to have shoes on, no bare feet, when you were having a lesson, and you could not paint your fingernails. Those were two important rules. My grandfather had this huge cat named Jacques, huge black cat, who was kind of a ferocious animal, and he loved that cat, and when students were having lessons, the cat was allowed to come in, and the cat did this thing of circling around <laughs> the student as they were playing, and that was the thing, you could not stop playing, you had to deal with this cat. He really had mellowed by the time that I had lessons with him. He used to say things like, you know, I'd be playing my Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and he'd say, I'm gonna wake you up at 3 a.m., and you better be able to play it by memory. But he never did, you know? And then as life went on, he sort of became my biggest fan. He was the, the person that would always say, oh, you have to hear my granddaughter play the violin. She's the best violinist on the West Coast. She's the best violin, blah, blah, blah. So he was, he was sort of a really my, my best champion. And the most interesting thing about him is that, you know, he was from this Russian school, and I went off into a, a, a Franco-Belgian school of violin playing. And there were times I would come home from Oberlin on a break, and I'd be learning a, a piece of music that he'd learned in a very specific style, and I was learning it in a very different kind of style. And his openness, you know, at first he'd be like, what? You're doing what bowing and what fingering? And then he would write me a letter that I would get a couple weeks later when I was back at Oberlin. I've really reconsidered um, what I'm doing here, and I really like these suggestions, and actually I'm, I'm going to play with these bowings and fingerings too. So he showed a real openness to, to the kinds of new things that were happening. It was wonderful. Yeah. So you became his friend. Yes, that's right, that's right, yeah. The power of that instrument, it just brings tears of joy. <laughs> oh, so are, are they making violins of that quality today? So this is the, the big thing, right? Why, how, why is it so good? What's the secret sauce? Um, it's, of course, incredible craftsmanship. It is, there's studies that are done on the wood that was used and did it go through, a, it went through a freeze and so it became denser than other wood that we might use today. Is it the varnish? There's all these kinds of things. Um, so it's been analyzed every which way, but it's just really excellent craftsmanship. Um, 
the, we heard Jack Benny say, I got the Stradivarius for $30,000. That's funny, right? Because you cannot get a Stradivarius violin today for under a million dollars. It's just not possible. Um, my mom said that she thinks that my grandfather played, paid $13,000 for this Burgundy back at that time, which was a lot of money back at that time. Um, and that my grandmother used to always point out and say, there's my house. <laughs> so this is the big problem for violinists today because violins are so expensive to really get something that you can play professionally. You probably have to spend about $100,000 just to have something that you can play professionally. Um, and so to be able to do that when you're a student and then you're, you're trying to maybe look at buying a house or pay rent is, is very, very hard. But the good news is there are great modern violins and they are expensive, a lot of the great ones, but if you can catch them right before they become famous, sort of like with artwork as well, before they appreciate in value, um, then it is possible to, to, to get an instrument that sounds really, really good. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? For Dr. Myers. Okay, well, I want to just join one more time in expressing my gratitude. This was really a wonderful way to weave together all of the elements of this exhibition and also highlight the possibilities for interdisciplinary co collaboration here at the College of Creative Arts and at West Virginia University. Um, I'd like to invite you all, we will be back at it again on March 3rd. We'll be meeting in our lower gallery where Elizabeth Satterfield, who's the curator and educator at Arthur Dale Heritage, will be speaking about our Blanche Lizelle mural that hung in the Monongalia County Courthouse. This is for those of you who've been friends of the museum for a long time you know that this is one of our greatest hits and we're really happy to have it on the wall again. And again, we're happy to have a community member, a WVU alum, and someone who's going to bring a unique and interdisciplinary perspective to the work talking about it. So that will be at noon on March 3rd. It's really easy, this 28-day month means that it's the <laughs> same day next month. And um, we hope to see you there. But for now, please also just join me in congratulating and thanking Michaela for this wonderful afternoon. Thank you.